going to take a look at the blood-brain barrier and the blood supply to the brain. Capillaries are normally where we exchange things between the blood and the tissues, but in the brain, the capillaries there are very different. So we've got the blood-brain barrier, which is really important to know. So the blood-brain barrier is obviously a barrier that is going to really limit and control what gets exchanged between the blood and the brain. So we have some glial cells, if you remember the astrocytes, they're going to reach out their little feet and they're going to touch the capillary walls and stimulate the endothelial cells that make up the walls of the capillaries to form tight junctions between them. And remember the tight junctions form leak-proof barriers. So things are not going to be able to move in between those endothelial cells anymore. So we're gonna create this really good barrier in the capillary walls. And the idea behind creating these tight junctions in the brain capillaries is this is going to allow the brain to really control what goes in and out of the brain, what gets exchanged, and that's going to protect the brain. Okay, so let's just take a look at the blood-brain barrier. So this is what capillaries look like in the rest of the body. So we've got the endothelial cells that make up the wall of the capillary and in between them we have some little gaps, some little pores. And so those gaps will allow things that are hydrophilic, so things like ions and glucose, uh, those things can freely pass out through those little gaps and be exchanged with the tissues on the other side. But remember the proteins that are in the blood, they're too big to fit through the little gaps in the capillary. So they will stay in the blood and not get out into the tissues. Okay, and then if you have things that are hydrophobic that are in the blood, so things like oxygen, carbon dioxide, uh, lipids, they can just diffuse right through those endothelial cells because they're hydrophobic. Okay, so that's what capillaries look like in the rest of the body. And you can see why they do exchange so easily because they're full of little holes. So here's the brain capillaries. We have the astrocytes in green, these glial cells, and notice their feet reach out and touch the endothelial cells making up the wall of the capillary. And they're gonna stimulate the endothelial cells to make tight junctions between them. And so that'll create a leak-proof barrier, close up those gaps that are normally there and so that'll prevent the things that are hydrophilic that are in the blood or out in the cerebral spinal fluid. And so those things that are hydrophilic are not going to be able to be freely exchanged between the brain and the blood. So if you want to exchange things that are hydrophilic, remember you've got to use a transport protein to get across an epithelial barrier. So the brain can control what transport proteins get put out or don't get put out. So the brain has a lot of control over that. But if you have things that are hydrophobic in the blood or in the brain, they can freely diffuse through the endothelial cells in the capillary. So if you have oxygen or carbon dioxide or even anesthetic gases that are hydrophobic, they will just diffuse right through and the brain can't control that. But the brain can control what's crossing through that blood-brain barrier if you have a hydrophilic molecule. So let's just show you how protective this blood-brain barrier is. So let's say that all of a sudden, the potassium levels in the blood spike, okay? So maybe, uh, for example, you know, this patient, all of a sudden their kidneys shut down. Okay, they go into renal failure all of a sudden. Um, and so now the kidneys are no longer able to get rid of the extra potassium in the urine. And so now it starts building up in the blood. And if you didn't have this blood-brain barrier there, these extra potassium ions would just diffuse out of the blood 
and go into the brain. And that would actually make the neurons in the brain more excitable. And that would start causing seizures. And that would be really bad. But because you've got this blood brain barrier, that prevents all of these excess potassium ions from getting out into the brain. And so the brain is going to be safe. It's not going to be affected by this spike in potassium ions. So that blood brain barrier is going to protect the brain from these high potassium levels that are in the blood. So that's why this blood brain barrier is, is so important. Okay. The other thing to talk about is the blood supply to the central nervous system, your brain and spinal cord. The CNS comprises 2% of your body weight, but it receives a pretty big part of your blood supply, 15%. And that's because the CNS has a really high metabolic rate. So your brain is using up 20% of your oxygen at rest. So that's a lot of oxygen. And remember that oxygen is being used by your body as the final electron acceptor at the end of the electron transport chain, the mitochondria, and that's being used to make ATP, right? So the brain is making lots of ATP, okay, in those neurons. And the brain is using half of the glucose at rest. Okay, and you're using that glucose, breaking it down to make ATP. Okay, and the central nervous system depends on blood flow to bring in that oxygen and that glucose. And if the blood flow to the brain gets cut off, then you're going to notice unconsciousness within probably 10 seconds, 20 seconds. And then you're going to get brain damage within about four minutes. So it doesn't take very long because those neurons are going to run out of oxygen. They're going to run out of glucose very quickly. They can no longer make their ATP and then they start dying. Okay, so really need to have a constant blood, blood supply to the brain to keep those neurons happy and alive. Okay, so the brain does not have any glycogen stores. And remember that it's very picky as far as what it's gonna use to break down to make ATP. So its favorite food is glucose. And if the glucose is not around, it could use ketones. And ketones are gonna be coming from breaking down fatty acids and you'll be producing those if you're starving. Okay, so it would prefer to use glucose, but if that's not around, it could use some ketones. But it can't use fatty acids themselves or amino acids. It can't use any of those to break down to make ATP. It has to be glucose or second choice would be ketones. And because there's no energy storage, in the brain, you've got to have a constant blood supply coming into the brain. And if that blood supply gets cut off, you're going to get brain damage very quickly and those neurons dying. So how do we get blood being cut off to the brain? Well, the most common cause would be stroke. Um, so there's two causes of stroke. The most common cause is you, is you get a blood clot that lodges in one of the blood vessels going up to the brain. So this is called an ischemic stroke, and that's pictured over here on the right. So we've got a blood clot that's lodged here, and this causes ischemia. Ischemia is just a word that means you've got a, a decreased blood supply to an area of tissue. And when you decrease that blood supply, those neurons become very unhappy very quickly because they need that constant supply of blood supplying the oxygen and glucose to make their ATP. And if they don't get it, they can't make their ATP and those neurons start to die. So 
So it's really important to get those patients to the hospital quickly so they can get treated, um, so we can resupply that area with, with blood. The other cause of stroke would be a hemorrhagic stroke. And this is where the blood vessel bursts. So the wall breaks open and the blood starts leaking out. And because the brain is encased in the skull, there's no room for swelling. And so the blood leaking out will start to push on the neurons with that swelling there. And then that will start to squish the neurons and start to kill them. Um, so that's a hemorrhagic stroke. And then this is showing an ischemic stroke where the person had a blood clot that lodged in this artery here. And that killed off this area of nervous tissue in the brain. And this area of dead tissue, that's called an infarct. So an infarct is just an area of dead tissue that get, got killed off because the blood supply got cut off. Okay, and you can actually see on this CT scan of the brain, this black area where the neurons have died. So this person, I'm sure, has some neurologic deficits from the stroke because part of their brain has died off from the stroke. 